So this is our fifth lecture, so lecture five, where we'll be talking about cost. So we'll be introducing cost, costing and cost analysis. So it's going to be a, a relatively short lecture because it's the first part of cost. We're going to be introducing a few terms, a bunch of definitions, a couple of examples. We'll speak a little bit about um, depreciation, and that'll be um, all that's included in your first class test. So the contents of the first class test include this lecture, but nothing beyond that. So a quick reminder of where we're at in terms of your uh, virtual project. So this is your dinosaur park. You've done the planning necessary for task one. You've done the WBS and the network diagrams, the Gantt chart necessary for task two. You should have made a start on task three. Task three has two elements, risk and cost. So this is where the contents of today's lecture will actually be um, implemented. So as I said, a lot of today's lecture will include uh, definitions. So when we talk about cost, we always think about accounting. And there are two types of accounting that you will come across. One is called management accounting, and one is called financial accounting. And in this module, we're interested in management accounting. So we're concentrated on accounting of costs in the future, as opposed to costs that have already taken place. So in finance, accountants are interested in expenses that have taken place, but in project management, we're interested in costs that we need to plan for the future. Some more terminology. In cost management, which is the, uh, sorry, cost management accounting, which is the type of accounting we're looking at, we look at three fundamental concepts. So in addition to cost, we have a cost object and a cost unit. So the cost, as you can imagine, is the amount of expenditure. Whereas a cost object is the activity with a separate measurement of cost is required. A cost unit is the actual, the actual end unit, the product. It's the actual thing that has a cost um, allocated to it. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about is going to be these cost units. And this cost unit could be a cost per thing sold. It could be a cost per amount of something. It, so that amount could be uh, a unit for energy. It could be a, um, a unit for volume or weight or a, a ton mile or a person hour. Or it could be just per widget, per item. Okay, so that's our cost unit. And we'll be talking a lot about that. More terminology. We talk about a cost center as being the part of the organization to which we can attribute these costs. Okay. In a minute, we'll introduce the idea of production and non-production costs, and therefore production and non-production cost centers. And this attribution happens through a process called cost allocation. That is, charging specific costs to a cost center. And cost apportionment is sharing costs between several cost centers. So take the example of the university's electricity bill. So the university has a single bill that it needs to share between different departments. 
So that sharing is cost apportionment. And the basis for which they use the sharing, they could do it according to the floor area. It could be according to the number of staff or the number of students. Or it could be some other unit or metric for apportionment. Three other important, um, or two other important um, terms we use are something called the conversion cost and the added value. These are slightly harder to visualize, but we'll, we'll look at an example to make this slightly clearer. So the conversion cost is the cost of taking the materials that go into your product into a finished product. So it's the cost of converting the raw materials into your finished product. So if you take the total production cost, and we'll look at what that means in a minute, and you subtract from that the raw material cost, that will give you the conversion cost, how much it, how much it costs to convert the raw materials into a product. So it's the total production cost minus the raw material cost. So if the total material cost for something came up to £100, and the materials only cost £20, then that difference, that's called the conversion cost. It costs £80 to convert that raw material into the final product. Now, the added value is that conversion cost plus the profit. Okay, so again, if we have... Um, materials that cost £20 and the production cost was £100. So that means your conversion cost was £80. Now, if you want to put a £50 profit on each of those items, then your £80 plus your 50 is your added value. So you've taken 20 pounds worth of materials and you've converted it through the conversion cost. You've converted that and then you've added 130 pounds worth of value. So it's the increase in the market value as a result of the processes performed. What are the processes? Well, the first is the production, and then there's actually converting it into a product and selling it. And that's where the profit comes in. And we'll look at a, 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 a more realistic example in a second. So first, let's watch a very brief video about... Hello, everyone. Let's learn about the cost flow in a manufacturing business, which produces envelopes. We will also learn about how to differentiate between classifications of cost. To produce an envelope, one needs pieces of paper and glue. They need to take the piece of paper, fold it in a certain way, and apply glue on certain parts of the paper. When the proper instructions are followed, we will end up with a finished product, an envelope, that we are ready to sell. These three steps are the three stages of production. In a manufacturing business, we have three inventory accounts. Raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Raw materials are all the materials we will need in the factory. Work in process represents all the products that are in process, partly finished or just started. Finally, finished goods are ready to be sold. As you can see, each inventory account is tightly connected to the stages of production. I want you to concentrate on the work in process account. In order to start producing the envelope, we need the paper and the glue. These are the materials that are directly included in the production. We call them direct materials. We will also need these two workers to fold the paper and apply the glue correctly. They are directly involved into the production and therefore we call them direct labor. Finally, we will need to include manufacturing overhead. This is the factory space over your head, the electricity and so on. Manufacturing overhead will not be covered in this lesson. You just need to know that we need it in order to start the production. In the manufacturing overhead we include the janitor, 
who is in direct labor, who cleans the factory space so we can work. He will also need a broom in order to clean the indirect material. The section named other includes the electricity, the factory space you're renting and so on. The amount of manufacturing overhead we applied to the work in process account is an estimate. You will see in later lessons why. You need to know how to differentiate between product costs and period costs. Product costs are the ones that are associated with the production, like direct materials, direct labor and manufacturing overhead. Period costs are the selling expenses your company will incur or if you have decided to pay for an advertising to be made for your products. These are expensed directly on the income statement. Another distinction you need to make is between fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are always constant like renting out the factory or the supervisor's salary. Variable costs are those that vary with the level of activity, like direct materials and direct labor. The more units are produced, the higher the cost of both materials and labor. This is the cost formula. It is simple algebraic equation. The total cost equals fixed costs plus units produced times the variable cost per unit. Finally, peace of mind. I hope you understood. If you didn't, you always have this button, which is pause, and this one, which is play. Play the video as many times as you need. I won't mind at all. Okay, so that was just a brief break from my voice. We're going to be, look be looking at some of those concepts in today's lectures, not all of them. So, cost classification. So, you saw how making that envelope was broken down into direct and indirect costs. So this is a really important classification. Direct costs are costs that can be linked directly to making that product or delivering that service. So everything, whenever we talk about a product, we also include the possibility that what's being sold is actually a service. So anything that can be directly linked to making or delivering that product or a surface is called a direct cost. Now, what we're talking about here is production cost. I'm going to highlight that because this is really important. We're talking about production cost. So in actually making something. So the example we're using is Greg's The Baker's. Okay, so the baker across, across the road from our department, that they sell, they sell pies and pastries and donuts and sandwiches. So the costs that go into making the end product, these are direct costs. They, they're called direct production costs because they're involved in the production. So, for example, all the ingredients of these pies, so the meat the flour, all the spices, all the ingredients, these are the materials. Now the labor, that's what we pay the people working in the shop. Okay, so the, the people that actually make these things. Not the people that sell them, but the people that actually make them. Their wages form part of the direct cost because you wouldn't have this if you didn't have someone to make it. So therefore, whatever we pay these people, or whatever these people are paid, comes out of, or contributes to, the direct production cost of the pie. But also there are other expenses. So the oven will have an energy bill. There'll be um, costs for operating the coffee machine. There will be costs for um, uh, operating the fridge. There will be costs for operating the equipment in the shop. Now, without these expenses, you wouldn't have the sandwich or you wouldn't have the product. So therefore, 
These are called direct production costs. They're direct because if they didn't, if they weren't there, you wouldn't have the product. So these are called direct production costs. Okay, so they include the direct material costs, the direct labor costs, and the direct expenses. Why do we call them direct, direct, direct? Because they relate specifically to the product or the service. So they're basically everything you can see. All right, so you pick up your pie, what do you see? You see the ingredients, these are direct materials. You see someone in the kitchen working, that's direct labor. And you see all the equipment running in the kitchen, that's your direct uh, expenses. These three together give you something called the prime cost. Okay, they're all direct costs, but we call this the prime cost. Now, you will have heard of something called um, overheads. Overheads, these are indirect costs. These are basically, this is the important world, all other costs. So all the other operating costs that are involved in the production of the final product, not directly linked to the product. Okay, so in direct costs, there was a direct link to the product. In indirect cost, it's not a direct link. It's involved, i.e. the product couldn't, couldn't arrive in your hand without these costs, but they're not direct costs. So for example, talking about our pastries, what about the napkin, the tissue, the paper box, the, the cardboard box that you're given, um, the, the wrapping of your sandwich? What about the cleaning fluid used to clean the kitchen, to clean the floor? There's other labor involved in a pastry shop. In addition to the people actually making your cake, the baker, you have the store cleaner, you have a server. So you have other people working in the shop that might not be related, might, that might not be involved in actually making the product, but without a server to serve you and without a cleaner to clean the, um, clean the shop, clean the oven, clean the uh, store, you wouldn't have an operating bakery. So we have indirect labor, just like we have indirect material. We have material that you're not going to eat, like the napkins and the cleaning fluid. And also, there are other expenses. So there's the expenses that go into the, um, the equipment that produce the pastry. That's called direct expenses. But then you have indirect expenses. So these are the costs of things like the rent of the shop, the rent of the uh, coffee machine, the insurance that you need to pay, etc. So these are expenses which you might not see. So if you go into the shop, you might not see this, but these could be considerable expenses. So we call the sum of all these, so indirect materials, indirect labor, and indirect expenses, we call these overheads. And to be specific, we call them production overheads, because this is all about the production of our end product. So what do we have? We have prime costs, and overheads, all contributing to something called production cost. Okay, now for a quick um, example question. So, let's say we have a project where we're manufacturing a batch of aluminium door handles. Okay, so we're making aluminium door handles. These are the costs involved. The question, and again, this is the kind of thing you need to be prepared for for um, your class test. What's the total direct cost? Total direct cost. So we're looking at total direct production cost. Okay, so it's understood that we're talking about total 
direct production cost. So just going back to the definition, the direct costs are direct material, direct labor, direct expenses. So what's the total direct production cost? Also known as the prime cost. So if you look through the list, we've got the actual cost of the aluminium. The cost of the aluminium will contribute directly to the cost of the handles. So that we count. We have the software and we have the stationery used in the design of these. We've got some wages, staff wages, the machinist's wages, we've got rent and insurance. Which of these are direct costs? So, software stationery, without it, maybe we wouldn't be able to sell these, but the software and the stationery, that they don't contribute directly to the end product, so they're not counted. But the wages that we pay the person on the factory floor making it, the machinist's wage, these are direct labor costs. Now, the, the cost of actually using the machine, so the milling machine will cost us 10,000 pounds to use, that contributes to our direct cost. Rent, insurance, these are overheads. Office staff wages, the office staff don't make these. So these are all overheads. So your answer is the sum of these three. So it's 30,000 plus 40,000 plus 10,000. So 80,000. That's your prime cost. Now, this is the same example again. This time, the question is asking for the overheads. So remember, the overheads, these are the indirect costs. So they're everything else. It's the, the costs that we didn't count. So it's the software. It's the office staff wages and the rent and insurance. So if you look at these, the first is indirect materials, the second is indirect labor, and the third is indirect expenses. So together, these three form your um, overheads. So five plus five plus 30 is 40K. So you can see that the, the production cost in this little example was equal to the sum of these two, the direct and the indirect. Or you can say it's the prime cost plus the overheads. Okay, so this is all production cost. We'll look at other costs next lecture. But I just want to make the distinction between prime and overheads, or direct and indirect. In this same example, where we're talking about um, uh, making our aluminium door handles, we can also calculate the... Um, added value. Remember we said the added value is the production cost plus the profit. So we've calculated the production cost, sorry, it's the conversion cost plus the profit. So the conversion cost, we said, is the total production cost that we just calculated minus the raw materials. So let's, let's work that out. 
So, the raw materials here, that was this 30. The conversion cost is the production cost minus the raw materials. Have we found the production cost? The production cost will be 40 plus 80. So basically, it's all of that. That's your production cost. So your production cost, let's do that in another color. Your production cost is the 80 plus 40 equals 120. And we're given in the question that the profit is 25. So that's your profit. So the question is, what's the added value? So the value added is that profit added to the conversion cost. The conversion cost is the production cost minus the raw materials. So 120 take away 30 is 90. So that would be your conversion cost, 90K. That's the conversion cost. So the value added is that 90 plus the 25. So that gives you 115. So a few steps involved, but hopefully it makes sense if you take it step by step. Okay, so now let's look at depreciation. Okay, so you've probably come across the term depreciation before. It's understood what it means, but perhaps not as well understood how to actually do it, calculate it, and, and deal with it. So when we talk about depreciation, we use that as a financial measure of wearing out, consumption, or loss of value. Generally, over time, or from use, or as a result of obsolescence, i.e. technology becomes obsolete. So it's a reduction, so depreciation is a reduction in the value of a fixed asset over time, or from use, or due to obsolescence. Okay, so you buy something, and it comes with a price tag. That's how much you pay for it. Over time, that value reduces. It has less value to you, and it has less value um, if you were to, to resell it. Why does that happen? It happens because of either obsolescence, passage of time, or from use we need to be able to calculate how much value our fixed asset has at a given point in time. And there are ways to do that. We can use time-based methods if it's um, depreciating over time. We can use um, uh, activity-based or volume-based methods if it's depreciating as a result of use. And we'll look at a couple of um, models for this. So the simple method, the simplest method, is time-based. And if we look at something called linear or straight-line depreciation or equal installments, it's simply a ratio of how much your asset cost divided by how long you expect it to last. Okay, so you, you buy something for 100K and 
it's going to last 10 years. If you divide the 100 by 10, that gives you £10,000 per year. That's how much it's losing its value per year. So in three years' time, it will have lost £30,000. That's the simplest way of um, doing it. It's not very accurate, but um, uh, that's that's how to calculate it. So something, for example, you bought this digger and it cost you 50k and it's going to last you 10 years, then that's 5,000 years per annum, okay? PA means per annum, that's per year. And we call this linear or straight line depreciation. Because if you draw a graph of how much it cost, sorry, a graph with time and value, it will depreciate linearly. And this initial cost, this net, this, this, this cost here that we're talking about, that's how much it cost us. That doesn't mean that that's just the price, the ticket price. Okay, it's. The purchase price, how much we paid for it, plus how much it cost to install, plus how much it cost to deliver, minus how much it'll, it'll um, be worth as scrap value. Okay, So just think of the example we all are familiar with when we speak about depreciation, when you buy an expensive smartphone or you buy a car. There's the purchase price. Sometimes you have installation and delivery costs, but there's always a net value. So if you buy a car for a certain value, if you know that at the end of your use, you can always sell the car for some scrap value, then you subtract that, you always deduct that from your original, um, uh, from your original cost to come up with the net asset cost. So that 100 is after taking into account the scrap value. So this is your first method, very simple, simple method. Slightly more sophisticated method is something called the reducing balance method, or the diminishing balance. That means rather than having a linear um, graph, what we have is a nonlinear. So what we're doing is we're taking a fixed percentage of the value of the asset every year. Let's look at an example. Say something costs you 30k, expected to last 10 years. Using linear depreciation, you'd say 30,000 divided by 10 is 3k per year. But let's say the rate of depreciation was 40% every year. So it's 40% off its value at that time. So at the end of year one, it will have lost 40% off its initial value. So 40% of 30,000 is 12,000. Now, that's how much it will have depreciated. So at the end of year one, its value will have dropped by 12,000. So it'll now only have a value of 18,000. So at the end of year two, we apply the 40% not on the 30,000, but on the 18,000. So now the depreciation in the second year is much less than the depreciation in the first year. In the first year, it dropped by 12K. In the second year, it only dropped by 7.2k. So the value at the end of the second year is that 18 minus 7.2, and there, that's the value at the end of the second year. So your graph will look something like that. So that's pounds. So it's a non-linear graph. A third way this isn't necessarily more sophisticated, but it's um, uh, more specific to production unit method, where your depreciation is based on how much your 
um, equipment is actually making or producing. Now, in this case, we're less interested in time, we're more interested in units produced. We're interested in production. So you still have your net asset cost, but this time, instead of only dividing by time, we're multiplying by how many units we produce in a year. So let's take an example. Say we bought a really expensive piece of equipment, a blanking machine. It costs 25,000. We estimate that its life will be one million parts. Okay, so we're no longer talking about time, we're talking about its lifetime in terms of production. So we divide the net asset over the estimated life, and we think it will produce a million components in its lifetime. So if you divide the 25k over a million, that gives you a rate of 2.5p per unit. So that's how much the value of my blanking machine is losing with every unit it produces. So every unit it produces reduces its life by 2.5 pence. So again, if you were to draw a graph with the number of units against its value, you should have a linear graph. Okay, and it should actually go all the way to zero. So back to our example, if I was told that the production level would be 11,000 units per year, I can now figure out how much depreciation I have in a year simply by multiplying 2.5 by 11,000. That'll give me how much I've lost per year. So now, if my horizontal axis is time, different years might have different um, gradients depending on how much production we have. So this is a more suitable depreciation calculation method for when we have a factory or a machine that's actually producing components or producing parts. So rather than using a simplistic linear method, or a diminishing uh, value method, we can use something called the production unit method. Again, a quick example. Let's say we bought a piece of equipment and it cost us 200,000 pounds. We expect it to last five years. It depreciates, there's an E there, at 20% per year. What is the value it would have in the company's accounts after four years? Okay, so again, the kind of question you should expect in your, in your test. So we're told it depreciates at 20% per year, so we're using the diminishing value method. So it's the non-linear method. How much after four years to the nearest 1,000 pounds? So... How would you answer it? You take your, if you want to do it step by step, you could take your 200,000 and you can look at how much it would diminish by in the first year. So it would diminish by 20% of 20,000, 40K. So that would bring the value down to 160K. At the end of the second year, a further 20%. Third year, another 20% fourth year, a further 20%. So that will bring it down to 81.9k. And the answer said to the nearest 1,000, to the nearest 1k, so that will be 82000. Okay, so not many, not many steps involved. And we could do similar examples for the other depreciation models. So that's, that's the end of what I wanted to cover with you in terms of cost and depreciation. This is the first part of the lecture. So in lecture 
four, we covered risk. And in lecture five, we covered an introduction to cost management, cost classification, and depreciation. Okay. Coming up next, we have our class test and workshops for task three. So again, a reminder of where we're at. We have just now completed lecture four and five. You've completed tasks one, two, task zero, and the questionnaire. Coming up, you have your class test, and hopefully you should be working on the video interview and the digital storytelling. Okay, so there's not much left. You simply have task three to go and another class test. Okay, so that will all, these are all going to be related. Okay, the skills audit is really easy. That comes at the very end.